Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new day. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we will get into our session. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to just come together and uh, learn from your word. And even as we've been learning the ministry of the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, Lord, there is so much that we still yet to grasp, Lord. We pray that you will continue to speak in and through us, Lord. Everything that we are learning, uh, let it be seeds sown in our hearts that will bear fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, everyone can hear me okay? Thumbs up will do. You can? All right, thank you, Sam. All right, so uh, we are in the final portion. Uh, I know uh, we, we last class we just looked at a, a few responsibilities. We looked at responsibilities and rewards of the pastor, uh, and we focused in or zeroed in on one main aspect that was our reward is a reward that is going to be from God, and God is the one who is going to give us a glorious crown. Um, it's it's not going to be a reward in, in the sense that, you know, the things that we see around us, material blessings, all of it is part of the rewards of, uh, you know, of being a pastor and ministry. Um, but, you know, the bigger picture is that our reward is from God and we get a glorious crown, a crown that will not fade away, um, a crown that is eternal. So even as we, no matter what we are doing, uh, ministry in the workplace uh, this should be our focus right so i'm i'm doing what i'm doing uh just so that i know that okay the reward that i have is from god and i and you know people around us may not reward us people around us may not recognize us and that's a difficult place to be in uh but remember that god is our uh, final rewarder and uh, we will be rewarded for everything uh, that we have done, right? Uh, everything right that we have done. Okay, so just a few uh, in uh, the last page, uh, a list of general responsibilities of the pastor. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go over this. A um, lot of it may be a little bit of a repeat, but let's just look at these 13 general responsibilities. Apart from the responsibilities that we spoke of, we put 10 down. Uh, but you, let's just look at these uh, general responsibilities, right? Now, firstly, pray and grow in relationship with God so that what is undertaken by the congregation reflects the leading of God. So the in each of these, you know, callings that we see, prayer is prayer and relationship to God, waiting on God is a very important aspect we see, right? Because what we pray, what we do in private reflects in our public ministry, right? So pray and grow in our relationship with God so that what we do, the congregations, the congregation will see it and they will begin to walk in it, right? To focus on uh, his family's welfare to ensure that they are cared for spiritually, emotionally, and physically now. Again, very, very, very important. You know, when it comes to pastoral ministry, especially when, you know, you're, you're, you're small, the ministry is small, husband and wife normally together do the ministry together. But as the church grows, as the ministry grows, uh, we start getting very busy, right? We start getting events, programs, you have to do a lot of legwork, a lot of work is involved, right? And many times we may put aside things, especially when it comes to family, uh, because we have this whole understanding and, uh, uh, you know, especially in towns and villages, uh, they say that, okay, I'll, I'll do God's work, God will look after my family. Now, in a sense, that's right, but that's also wrong. Right. Uh, I always say this, there's God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. God has given us a family and we will, we are, we are to look after our family. We do God's work, 
but we also look after our family. And Paul writes it very clearly. He says, how can you look after the church when you're not able to look after your own family? So he's putting it as a criteria that if you cannot look after your family, don't lead in the church. That's basically what he's saying. So as a pastor, now I have seen many, many, many pastors and ministries, very good ministries, very good pastors, beautiful churches built from ground up, um, from zero. You know, they just started the church with a few people in their homes and they've grown and come up to a big congregation. Uh, but what I've noticed is either one, there's loneliness, Two, there is uh, dissatisfaction. Or three, the children are rebellious. And it's very sad to see that. Now, why is that? Because sometimes we get so busy doing ministry that we forget to take care of our own families, right? spiritually, emotionally, physically. Right? Uh, and so I think what we must do is we must set certain guidelines. I think many of us are young here, may not be married or may not have children. But if we, ha if we have families, um, we need to set aside, set aside time for them. Right? Uh, so for example, some of the things that I have personally learned, and I'm, you know, it's not like I've learned everything, but something that I'm doing uh, is, I remember before getting married, you know, I would be there everywhere. You know, worship, uh, sharing the word, North, South, East, all the locations, worship, events, conferences. We would carry the equipment. We would be everywhere. Right? And then that habit continued after my marriage. Right? So every time I was going for events, programs. But what I learned is over time that I need to be there, especially when the kids started growing up. I realize I need to be there for the children. If I'm not there, what is the point of me going to church, standing on the pulpit, you know, preaching and um, you know, ministering God's word, giving all these you know, powerful sermons or powerful worship leading? What is the point of all that? And I'm not looking after my own kids. It doesn't make sense. Right? So what I decided was, I will, from now on, just lead worship. You know, Not from now on, this happened a couple of years back. I decided, OK, once a month, I will lead the worship. Right? Because Saturdays is a day I keep with the kids. We go out, we spend time together. We play soccer, we play games, uh, just spending time together. Because I know that Sunday, we all go to church, we're busy, we come back, the kids get you know, do their homework and all of it. And then Monday to Friday, the routine starts again, right? Where they go to school, come back. And we are also, Monday to Friday, we're busy, right? So we set aside time. Right? Something that we do, especially uh, something that we like to do at home is we have Friday Friday nights as game nights. Right? So we, we just play a lot of games. Uh, it could be simple indoor games, but we spend time together as a family. Right. And I thank God for these times of family. Now, I can give you examples of many, many, my own friends who are pastors, children, wonderful ministry. But these guys, my own friends, you know, they've, they've gone away from God. They have an aversion when it comes to church. They don't like church. And I've asked them, well, you know, you grew up in the church. Now, it doesn't happen always, right? Uh, it's wonderful to see pastors and their children just getting into the calling and, you know, eventually becoming pastors. That's the greatest joy you can find. But uh, most often, it doesn't happen. Uh, why? Because the, the pastor or the leader has not been there for the son or for the daughter, for the children. They've not been there. They've not been there for their sports day. They've not been there for you know taking them out. But every time, it's either a prayer meeting, life group meeting, cell group meeting, uh, you know, uh, evangelism meeting, some meeting or the other. 
another child is growing up without a father and a mother. You know what's the biggest mistake people do in ministry? They leave their kids with their relatives and their parents or, or, or their grandparents and they go out and do ministry. Say, oh, I'm doing ministry. The children are safe there. Yeah, but then the children are not getting the love and affection that the child needs. And nobody can take a place of a father and a mother. Nobody. No grandfather, grandma, nobody can take that place. Even when it comes to a husband and wife, nobody can take the place of a husband. Nobody can place, take a place of a wife. And I remember this. I was talking to a, a, a young, not, not young, but probably in their mid 40s. Um, this couple, they, they're from our city but uh they were you know they got married they were so zealous for god right so they got married they had a, a child but they would go out on missions right they would go to different parts of india just going out ministering evangelizing doing a wonderful ministry right and what happened was during this time the child was left at their mother's house. And at that time, uh, you know, especially the child was in the grandparents house. And at that time, this this child is growing up in the mother's house, uh, in the grandmother's house. And now the the boy, the little child is about 12 years old, right? The parents have never been for any of the child's they were not there when the child started speaking. They were not there when the child started walking. Uh, they were not there for their, you know, but they would do everything, right? Put him into school, put him in a good school, but they were not there for him. Now this boy is probably about 14 years old and he is just turned away from them. He doesn't want anything to do with the children, with the parents. He doesn't want anything to do with God. And now the parents are saying they they've stopped traveling, they've stopped you know going out on ministries. They've got a small ministry uh, that they've begun here in the city. They're saying we wanted our son to become our pastor and lead the church, but you know they were crying their heart out. I was speaking to them for one and a half hours. The mother was just crying and crying and crying, saying, "I've made a mistake." My, my son doesn't even pick my own calls. He doesn't want to do the ministry. And then when I asked them about why does he feel this way, this was the whole story that they gave me. And I think about this. The father was saying, I wish I had not chosen. I wish I had not done what I had done when I was younger. Right, but the damage was done very hard to talk to this boy you know, he he was you know um, so rebellious uh, he had a couple of earrings and chains and tattooed his hands and you know he was saying no I, I i don't want anything to do with the church i don't want anything to do with my parents i don't want anything to do the only people he respected was his grandparents was his grandparents and he would only listen his grandfather had passed away, but he only listened to his grandmother. He only respected his grandmother, nobody else. I, I can see why. Because his grandmother was the only one who looked after him growing up. As a pastor, now, even as we are, you know, many of us still have a lot to look ahead to get married, do the ministry, do not focus too much on ministry and forget your children or forget your family. We need to balance them. We need to learn to balance them. Right? Take breaks. It's all right. Ministry will continue without you. No problem. It's not like we are the one man person without us. The whole ministry will come crumbling down. No. You see the importance of raising leaders. You raise up leaders, give them opportunities. Take breaks, take time, set aside time for yourself and your family. Three, 
seek God's vision for the church and be the primary vision caster for the ministry. Now, even as we talked about, you know, uh, how to, you know, uh, especially as a pastor, you start off the church as, as things that you have to do. Um, you know, in the local church, we're talking about it. Uh, the the initial phases, the survey phase, the planting phase. One of the role of the pastor, very important, is to be the uh, to seek God's vision for the church, and then. You know, especially if you're starting a new church, you have to get that vision from God, and then you cast the vision. You you share the vision with people. This is what I want to see uh, the church doing. This is what I want to see the ministry as. Uh, this is our vision for the church. You're casting the vision. You know, it's like casting a net into the sea. Um, and then once you cast the net, the fish come in. Now, uh, it's not like we are grabbing people. No, uh, we can't force people to to join in that vision which God has given you, but you're casting it out. You're just, in the sense, you're you're laying that vision out, and you're inviting people to partake or to to join in that vision. Right? Uh, here's the thing about vision, right? When you have a vision from God and you you put it out or you invite others, God will bring people to follow you. Best example, David was hiding for his life. He was hiding in the caves. He knew he's going to be the next king of Israel. And God sent 400 men to be with him. Can you think of that? They came to David and said, David, we will be with you. We want to be under your leadership. David is probably saying, why? I'm hiding from, I'm running away from Saul. King Saul can come anytime. Why do you want to be with me? I have nothing with me. But they saw something in David. They saw that there was something in him. And 400 people came and stayed with David. Later on, they became, uh, you know, mighty captains in uh, uh, Israel's, in David's army. Right? So when you cast a vision, God will send the people. Right? But you have to cast the vision in the right way. Fourthly, oversee the teaching and preaching of the word. Of course, we talked about this. Um, we teach the word, we preach the word, and we oversee. As pastors, we oversee, we, we bring correction, we bring exhortation. And uh, you know, it's very important to be open to correction as well. Right Now, we will get opportunities to preach, to teach. Be open to correction. Right? Uh, uh, make sure that the word that is being taught is in line. You know, the teaching is is correct. is in is is in line with God's word. We're not digressing. We're not you know teaching some false doctrines. So ensure that is happening in the right way. Be the stewards responsible for the administration of the sacraments that we talked about. Two important sacraments: the Lord's table and water baptism. But there are other. Um, uh, you know, other things within the church as well that you will have to, um, you know, be there for counseling, uh, training, teaching, all of that. And then number six, in all things, strive to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, this is a very, very challenging task for a pastor. Strive to maintain unity of the spirit Sorry. Uh, yeah, unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, in a local church, we have people from different backgrounds, different settings, different understandings. People are different. As a leader, we should let that sink in, especially into our mind. Just because a person may have learned something very fast doesn't mean that everyone else are the same. Just because one person has highest respect for you as a pastor doesn't mean others will, will have the same kind of respect. Remember, we are dealing with people. People are different. There are differences in opinions. Some people like old hymns. Some people like Choruses, some people like the new kinds of worship. Some people like point by point sermons. Some people like stories in their sermons. Some people like 
45 minute sermon some people like 10 minute sermon now there will be many 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 differences and this is where as pastors we are called to strive to maintain the unity of the spirit how can i do that one way is initially when you start off uh, or you're planting a church or, or even if you have been placed to lead a church um, as a pastor show yourself as an example of somebody who wants to walk in unity who wants to walk in peace right now there's a difference in we need to be very careful when we're talking about unity we must also avoid favoritism because you know if i if i don't be careful there i can cause miscommunication and people may take it the wrong way and it can cause strife so if there is a conflict or a misunderstanding between two people in the church do not speak you know do not take one side of the story and make a decision take both the sides of the story and i can give you a couple of examples and uh, uh, you know it was only after i listened to the other person i understood hey actually what this person person a was saying was saying half the story but he didn't say the rest of the other half but the person B said the rest of the other half. That is why person A got angry. But the whole story was not told. Right? But the point of all these, you know, we, we will have these misunderstandings, conflicts within church congregation. Our end goal is not, as a pastor, is not to see who to, you know, who should be thrown out of the church or who should be asked to leave from the church. Or who's right and who's wrong our end goal is to understand that yes both may be right both may be wrong our end goal is the unity of the spirit hey we are one body we are believers in christ we are called to walk in unity walk in peace walk in love so that's the end goal it's not about who's right and wrong yes as pastors we have to you know make decisions for example we'll have to say see what you did was wrong or to the other person say hey what you said was wrong yes that's important but that's not the end of the story we don't let them go okay you said this that's why you're wrong you did this that's why you're wrong no the end is a and b are walking in unity even though there are differences you and I as pastors must bring that differences and and make them or help them walk in unity. It is possible. It is possible. The Holy Spirit can do that. Right? Now, again, you cannot force people to walk in unity and to walk in love. There will be times people will just continue to, you know, just have hatred, anger, uh, talking from a place of unforgiveness. Now, this is called uh, backbiting, jealousy. All of that will happen. So that's when you and I, as a pastor, will have to take a stern decision. Right? But even when we take a stern decision, our end motive is the bond of peace, to try and bring unity into the, into the church. Right? Then, seventh one, establish ministries that seek to ensure that every member and prospective member is cared for in a christ-like manner so within a church something that we follow in apc is we have a team called the member care team i know in the member care team uh see on sundays people come they finish church probably have some time of fellowship they go back home we have the life groups that meet probably during the week they have you know uh, fellowship again people's people pray for each other all of that but on an ongoing basis you know we need to care for our people for example bereavement somebody has lost a loved one in their family now 
it's not like we can just say call and pray and say hey uh, you know i understand what you're going through let me pray for you and end it now if if it's just a five minute call it's not going to serve the purpose i mean at that moment it may serve the purpose uh but it's it's not solving the problem this person has lost a loved one and is going through will go through a season you know we talked about it in the mentoring hour about grief there are different kinds of uh, grief and different ways that people handle grief so as a member care team we go through them during the season of bereavement for a period of about three to four months at least you know just calling them talking to them sometimes we just have to listen to them sometimes we go visit them just have a small prayer in their house and you know just share a small word they're encouraged right or there's a there's someone who's sick in the hospital right um, and so we need we go to the hospital visit them or if there's a need um, you know in the hospital for somebody to be available there we we you know we try and help out as much as we can um, you know birthdays anniversaries we wishes uh, or people need any help within the church the member care team is a team that works towards helping the members know that we care for them it's not like you come every sunday you go back uh, you you know you 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 learn you grow and then that's it no we want to ensure that we care for the people uh, and we've been learning in the local church one of the aspects the local church is a family and right? so we learn to care for them so the member care team that we have right now in APC, we have about three people in the team uh, we call we talk we are there to help out anyone can contact us for any kind of need um, right and we're there to help out right? now initially as a church you may not have like a team because you are the pastors they will you know you would have to go be there for them but i think as the church grows uh, grow to 100 200 people you can have a team in place initially you can have it as a volunteer driven team and then eventually probably get staff involved right then raise up god's people into leadership for of his church equipping empowering and supporting them for their god-given ministry basically raising up leaders right raise up people to become leaders understand here's the here's the challenge you and i face uh as pastors not a challenge but we must be we must really look to the lord for this one is identify leaders so i may ask myself how do i identify leaders do i see their gifts do i see uh you know their potential do i see their status do I, what, what do i see or do I see their character? Now, all of you know, character, gifts, skills, all of this is important, right? So when I'm looking at raising up leaders, I look at all of this: commitment, character, right? Gifts, skills. How how are they? Uh, you know, one of the things I do is I give them the smallest task possible, and see if they're able to best example is now you know we have a lot of people coming to church especially our east location and they say uh, you know they probably one month two months in church or maybe even five six months they say i have i am a sound engineer i'm a sound engineer I've, I've been a sound engineer for 10 15 years more than five six people have called have said this to me I've been a sound engineer for about five to six years or ten years, and so I know everything about sound. So I want to join the sound team. That's wonderful. But now, before I, you know, get them into the place of you know mixing and doing the stuff on the digital mixer, what I do is I tell them, okay, if you want to join the sound team for the first six months. You will only be carrying equipment. So you'll be carrying speakers, cables, setting up the mic, uh, 
you know, setting up the stage. That's it. And after six months, you'll be trained on how to mix, meaning how to use the, uh, the digital mixer. And out of five of them, four engineers, sound engineers, didn't turn up. Four of them. They said, no, we don't want to come. Now, that, that shows the heart. No, I'm, not, I'm not putting them down. But it only shows the commitment. See, gifts and skills is good. But we must also see if they are committed, if they are willing to walk with the vision of the church. Now, it's easy to come on a Sunday morning at 7.45 and say, OK, just take the mixer and start mixing the sound. Whereas the others do all the hard work, come early, set it up. Uh, it's not fair on them because I want to see them becoming, you know, sound heads. I can't just take some just because somebody has 15 years experience as a sound engineer, he can come and say, I want to be the sound head. Uh, he said that, but I, I knew that uh, I have to do this the right way. So I said, six months, you'll only carry speakers for. They didn't turn up for the next few Sundays. And uh, I did call them. I asked them, what happened? I didn't see you on Sunday. They said, no, I said, I'm not too keen on coming. So you can make up, right? Now, while raising up leaders, you equip them, you empower them, you support them in, God, in the ministry that God has given them. But you don't give them opportunity, meaning you don't put them in a pedestal just because they have the skills and abilities. You give them time. Give them the smallest thing to do. See how faithful they are. Look at their character. Right? And the person, the one person who is a sound engineer, and he, uh, he stayed back. He was willing to carry the sound equipment, do all of this. And he did it for six months. And now he's a sound head. And he's got the vision. He's got the uh, what he wants, to, what we need as a church. So now, some Sundays he says, "No, you be the sound head. I'll do the uh, setup." You see, there's no, there's no strife. There's no uh, disagreements within the team. Everything is working good. So when it comes to raising people in leadership, identifying leaders, to giving them opportunities, and then they step into the call. Right. Uh, now, as pastors, we have to be watchful. Right? We, we, we look, we see people, we see what is their attitude towards things. How do they, how do, they do you know, what they're doing? There was this one time uh, we had a leader in church, and uh, many years back, I think it was 2018 or 19, he was part of <clears throat> the setup team as well. And uh, he would always give his name. Very good boy, very good person. He'd always give his name. But he was always late. He'd say, I'll come three Sundays in a month and I'll set it up. I'll, I'll help in setting up. But he's always late. 45 minutes late, half an hour late. He's always late. So I had to sit him down. I said, listen, see, I like the heart that you have. You want to serve. You want to do some things to the church. But I've noticed that you're always coming late. Now, here's what happens. When you come late, the team is struggling because they depend. there's two hands less. There's a lot of things to get done. Right? So the team is struggling. Two, it's not good for you when you give a certain time, you should be there. That's being responsible as a leader. So here's the thing. What you do is two Sundays. Two Sundays. You give availability for two Sundays. But on those two Sundays, you come on time. And you'll be there on time. And then eventually, you will see how you are able to grow uh, and how you learn. And so for him, it was a challenge. So the one thing he told me was, you know, if it's night, I'm not a morning person. I can stay awake the whole night, Pastor. But morning is a challenge for me. I don't know why. I, I want to come. 
I want to do it. Right? But mornings is a big challenge. I'm just not a morning person. I said, see, if this is what God has called you for, if you want to do this, then there is a sacrifice. You will have to make that decision. And you will have to wake up and you will have to come. But you will have to come on time. Otherwise, there is no point of you giving your name and coming late. So I think as pastors, we have to come to this place of supporting them, exhorting them, but also correcting them, refining them. Right? Uh, that way they learn. Right? Uh, you know, I remember telling some of my classmates when I was in Bible college, I say, come on, the class starts at 8 a.m. I was in Bible college as a Bible college student. Uh, we used to start class at uh, 8 30 if i'm not wrong yeah 8 30 8 to 8 30 was worship so the prayer starts at eight o'clock how can you be in your hostels at 7 55 and expect to be there in the college at eight collision it takes 10 minutes for you to walk from the hostel to the college but 7.55, you're still running about searching for your shoes. How are you going to be there in college? I'll be there, I'll be there. Simple things. And I would, you know, really, uh, you know, I was very stern with them. The first half of the, day, of the day, I was very stern with them. The second half, I'll be apologizing to them. Okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have spoken like that. But the point is, I wanted to see things change. I wanted to see their lives. I wanted, I wanted to see, because these are guys who are going to become pastors. They're all pastors' children. Imagine the pastor as they go back home from Bible college and then they go in there and then it's Sunday morning and they're still sleeping and it's another 10 minutes for the church to start. That would be embarrassing. It will only reflect on how they've been as a person. So, uh, so I should keep telling them, I should keep encouraging them. Don't do this. Get it right. It's simple things. But when you do this right, God is honored. God will be glorified. Uh, but then eventually they, they took it up. Right? And it's wonderful to see them become such wonderful uh, leaders and pastoring. They're all pastors. Now. Most of them are pastoring their uh, parents' church. Uh, right? But they've learned such beautiful things. Sometimes they message me and they say, you know, uh, Paul, I remember what you said about this. Uh, it's so helpful, the sermons that I prepared and I preach. It's so helpful now. Uh, it's been so many years, but they still you know, message and call. Now, the reason is not to boast about what I have done, but the, the point is these small things that we tell people, we encourage them. It lasts in their life. It makes an impact. Right? We may not know. But as a pastor, when we speak into their lives, it definitely makes an impact. Right? Then, supervise the other staff, nine points. Supervise the other staff of the congregation to keep the ministry in a common direction aligned with the vision. Right? Super supervise the staff of the congregation. So there is there are staff. If you have a church with staff, and nowadays, I think, uh, especially in cities, uh, at least you will have a graphics designer, you will have somebody in IT and somebody in media because every church is now online. It doesn't matter even if you have 50 people in a church, they have something online, so you'll need a graphics designer, you'll need a media person. Uh, and I think whoever the staff is, it's important that as a pastor, we uh, direct them, we align them to the common vision of the church. Right. Uh, then provide spiritual direction for daily operation of the congregation. Um, now, especially when you're starting off, as a pastor, you'll need to be there. As the years go by, right, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, the wheels bring come into motion. Right. So you're set. You know, OK, this is how the church is. This is how the church functions. These are the leaders. So even if the senior pastor is not there, we've got associate pastors. If the associate pastors is not there, we have uh, assistant pastors. If assistant pastors are not there, we have volunteer leaders, ministry leaders who can continue 
and the wheels are just in motion. Uh, but you will have to put in the grinding work of initially setting things in place, right? Setting spiritual direction. Eleventh one, oversee the development of the stewardship of the members to ensure financial time and talent support for the ministry of the church. So as the church grows, you have people from uh, different backgrounds who have different capabilities, skills, all of that is there. Uh, you, you encourage the congregation to be good stewards of what God has given them financially, through their time, through their talents as well. Right? Uh, and then we help them. Right. Uh, sometimes, you know, the financial workshops is something that we have at APC. So we help people to, you know, to understand how to, you know, budget, how to finance, what to do, how to save up, how to plan your uh, income, your finances. Then we have um, usage of time and talent. And uh, talent, of course, there is there's a wide range of talent that will be available within the church. So we encourage people. Right? Uh, I remember this uh, this one person. This happened many, many years ago. Uh, this one person that many years in the sense, uh, maybe three, four years ago. Uh, there's this one person who I didn't know, right? So he, he would come every Sunday to church. Uh, this is in Mangalore. And uh, every Sunday he would come to church. Finish church, he would talk to everyone. And after a while, some of his friends, he started inviting his friends. So his friends would come to church along with him. And his friends came and told me, oh, what's the procedure to get into the worship team? See, this is the thing. We are still a growing church. So at least three months, you should be in APC. And then there's an audition. You go through the audition. And then once, if you've done well, you go through like maybe a month of just uh being there for the practice sessions and then you're rostered and so some of the friends said to me why isn't this person not in the worship team I said, because uh, i didn't know it and i said oh does he play an instrument and then his friends said to me he is one of the best guitarists in our friend circle like he's very good as a guitarist so i remember i went to him his name was david I said, David, do you play an instrument? He said, yes, I play a little bit of guitar. Uh, but what was he doing? He was doing, you know, uh, setting up the chairs in the church. He said, I play a little bit of guitar. So why don't you audition? Said, OK, I'll try to audition. And he came to, for the audition. I gave him the song. He came for the audition with his electric guitar and one, you know, big pedal and one, you know, the iPad. And he's connected and he was like, fully into all of this. And he started playing guitar. And I looked at him and I said, how many years have you been playing? He said, I've been playing for the past 12 to 13 years. And he was such a good guitarist. Right? And sometimes, you know, I'm just giving you this example. Sometimes we there are people around us. They have talents that we have not even known and not even recognized. Or sometimes they don't want to show that talent. But I hear as leaders, we are to uh, support them. And I remember telling this boy, very young boy, said, you come, you get in, you're in the worship team, you come and serve. And later on, after six months, I realized his actual instrument was drums. So he's a drummer as well. And so, you know, things like this happen. That's where you and I as pastors, we, we got to help encourage them. Tell them, hey, these gifts and talents you've given, God has given you. Use it for God. God will multiply. God will bless it. Right? And uh, it's wonderful, especially because they're being good stewards of what God has given them. Right? Then, 12th one, be responsible for Christian counseling. Uh, of course, we do that at APC. We also have our Chrysalis counseling, which is a more of a uh, very... Uh, professional counseling so there'll be times when you know remember the first point of contact is mostly the pastors right if you're leading a, a church as a pastor they will first come to you say this is my problem this is what i'm going through so there'll be times you'll have to say listen i think you'll need professional counseling so we can hand them over to uh, 
uh, a professional Christian counselor. But in the meanwhile, you're always there, you're checking up on them, you're giving them uh, encouragement, uh, exhorting them, uh, just being there for them, right? Uh, and then finally, conduct services, which we talked about weddings, funerals, baby dedications, and many other kind of uh, events that go that happen within a local church. Right, uh, so we'll stop here. I know uh, we have two more aspects that we need to talk about. One is the reformation of the uh, past teacher teacher's ministry and uh, reformation of the pastoral ministry. Uh, what we'll do is we will pick that up from probably the next week and uh, uh, we'll have enough time to uh, complete that as well. Also, I know I've been a little bit late on my on the midterm assessment, so I'll have that up soon. Very simple open book midterm uh, assessment. Um, so it's going to be very simple. And then we'll follow that up with the final assessment as well. So both will be 50 marks each. All right, All right any questions, any thoughts? All right, so let's just close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for teaching us, Lord, and thank you for ministering to us. We pray, God, that you will continue to, Lord, sow seeds in our hearts, oh Lord. We thank you for your presence. Uh, and even as we take up this role of leading as a pastor, Lord, that we will remember that everything that we do, we will glorify your name. We thank you for each one of us. We thank you for the opportunity to learn, to grow, to lead. We covered each one of us into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful weekend. And I'll see you. Next week. Bless. Um,